Well, good afternoon, or Lake Carl, good evening everybody. We do have some people here, so I'm going to be trying to talk to them and watch the screen as well. But uh, as Carl said, I'm going to move through this quite quickly because we have quick speak, uh, a lot of speakers. Uh, I just had a talk today out at our Ag Lenders Conference in Fargo, and I did a 40-minute talk out there. Just a couple of things that you see on the screen here, and some of you at some locations may have handouts, but you see my website there. I'm going to show only about 15 slides, but I have about 40 slides on my website, and so uh, I like to use charts and uh, because a picture is worth um, a thousand words, and so if you see a chart on here, maybe a month from now that you want to look at, just help yourself get on my website. We try to update this cattle situation and outlook, and, and it's, a, again, a much longer version approximately every week, usually on Monday. So uh, uh, just do that. Obviously, these are very exciting times in the entire livestock industry, including the cattle business. We've got um, record prices, but with that comes record volatility, uh, record uncertainty. Uh, I remember our last year's meeting that we held here, things looked really, really uh, good and uh, supply and demand conditions were very favorable for backgrounding. I think this year you're going to see we're back to a more normal situation where, you know, certainly there can be profits in backgrounding, but you maybe have to have a little sharper pencil than last year and with feed being as high as it is and so on. So it's certainly there's profit potential and the rest of the speakers are going to talk a, a, a lot about a, diff, uh, a lot of different alternatives. So let's move along here. Again, uh, we have set records for all market classes of beef cattle, wholesale beef prices, retail beef prices, uh, last two years, and well, 2011, and this year I'm already saying that we're going to have record prices this year, even though it, it isn't over yet, because we've already been high, higher than enough from last year to do that. But again, the question is about, on the bottom there, how about 230? 2013 and what could derail prices and here we're going to spend most of our time just talking in the shorter run between now and February and March when we're doing backgrounding but there are a whole host of issues that can affect the cattle business and you see some livestock production and price patterns there on the top of the screen and uh, I'm just going to mainly do number one, the seasonal there tonight, because we want to know what's going to happen the rest of the year, and in the February and March, that's what's affecting background. I'm not even going to mention the cattle cycle. The cattle cycle is important, and we still do have a cattle cycle. And uh, this afternoon at, at our lenders conference, I did mention a little bit on that. I'll just finish up with the long term, not again that that's really going to affect backgrounding this year. But again, all these unexpected things can affect the cattle business, and they are affecting the cattle business, and therefore we uh, maybe need to look at price risk management and be very careful. Even you might say, well, backgrounding is just from now until uh, February, so what could happen then? Well, a multitude of things can happen that affect prices. And you see I've got 2000 or 2013 in question mark there. But just this year, go under that, we started off in March with the lean, fine textured beef thing that really depressed prices there in March and April. Uh, go over a little on the screen. I'm not sure if my cursor will, if I can get it to go fast enough or not. But you see BSE there. We had a case of BSE then in April. Uh, just below that is drought, and my main concentration there is going to be on the drought and how that's affected uh, cattle prices and will continue to affect cattle prices. Obviously, it's affected me in the short run, but long run, and I'm not going to worry as much about the long run tonight. So we've had three very significant events. Uh, slaughter steer prices right now are a buck fifty to two dollars lower than they would have been if we wouldn't have had LFTB, and then we did get through uh, BSE. Uh, without much impact on prices, but the drought, as we'll see here now, has been uh, uh, really, really a major factor and a game changer, both in the short run and it's going to have a lot of long run implications as well in the cattle business. So on the left, you see what the drought monitor looked like on June 5th. Um, the darker the color, the worse the drought on this chart. So you see back there on June 5th, go down to the corn, North Dakota was in pretty good shape, go down to the Corn Belt, Iowa, Illinois. They were slightly dry, but actually that was positive for the cattle business because uh, they were able to get the corn crop in early, and usually an early corn crop means a high yield. So on June 5th, USDA was predicting a record 15 billion bushel corn crop, 
and uh, that would have been fantastic for the entire livestock sector. And um, unfortunately, when you go to the right-hand uh, column there, or the right-hand map, you see that the drought set in, and actually it was worse in the eastern Corn Belt, but it has improved there some, but still very, very dry to the south of us, and even dry in North Dakota. So that had a dramatic impact on the corn market. Again, we were expecting 15 million bushels on June 5th, and by July 5th, we were down to about 12 billion, and within a couple of weeks after that, USDA had reduced it, and still we're right now about 10.7 billion. So, in the matter of a month, we had to decide how we would use 4 billion bushels less corn and get uh, those people out of the market. Uh, and so, uh, let's see. I'll just go to this and then come back. So, what happened? You can see there, uh, there are, are two different colors on this chart. The top line starting on the left-hand side were November feeder cattle futures back in, uh, you see, into the middle of June there, right at 164. And corn was down there about $5 on the bottom. Again, if, we, if that 15 billion bushel crop would have come to fruition, we would have dropped futures on down below this chart, below 450, and we would have been talking about much lower corn prices. But you see the opposite effect there but between feeder cattle futures and corn futures. Uh, as soon as we knew we were going to have a smaller, smaller crop and it quit raining, corn soared from $5 up to $8 and feeder cattle fell from uh, 164 down to 142. And then we were in a trading range then after we knew about what the crop would be through midsummer. There you see in September, uh, we did lose about a dollar on corn and that helped us pick up feeder cattle a little bit, but we've just been, you see, moving in the opposite direction and that is going to be the case. And what this tells me is that we're going to see extreme volatility, volatility like we've never seen before this spring and the closer we get to spring because we need a record corn crop next year to get by. We are going to virtually run out of corn this year. The nice thing about um, last year we had a short corn crop too, but it only had to last 11 months because we had a month early corn harvest and we were able to fill the bins. Now we've even got a shorter crop this year, and if we have more normal harvest next year, it means an even shorter crop is going to have to last 13 months. And so as we approach spring and see how many acres we're going to plant and what the weather's doing, is it still dry in the corn belt or whatever, we are going to see just uh, uh, unparalleled uh, jumps from day to day, week to week in corn prices, and then you see the opposite effect in feeder cattle. And uh, depending on how long you're backgrounding, if you're doing some of these program particular heifers we're going to talk about later on where you might keep them longer, uh, our expectations are extreme volatility. So that's the one thing I want to get across to you that and many people say, when are we going to go back to normal? When our price is not going to be so volatile, and, and that isn't the case. They're going to be volatile. So. The most important driver of feeder cattle prices and then backgrounding potential that we're going to see here in the next several months are really shown right here and around the bottom. It's all about feed. What are your feed costs? What feed availability do you have? And then feed around the country. So I've already talked to you about corn prices there on the left. I just dumped, jumped ahead and came back. Again, they're going to be extremely volatile. We've established a trading range there now probably in in corn futures where we were up to uh, uh, eight and a half dollars almost and then down to about seven and a half. So likely for the next couple months they'll bobble around there unless we get uh, a major scare that the, that the crop is even below 10.7 billion bushels. But uh, into the new year then it'll be even more volatile like I said. Another issue is, and these are competitive ours for backgrounding up here, is winter wheat pasture in the southern plains. 
Obviously, they're in the driver's seat for putting weight on calves because that winter wheat is basically free as long as you got a fence around it and some water because it's going to go dormant anyway, so it's free grazing. The winter wheat conditions have not been the best, but just recently, particularly across uh, eastern Oklahoma, they've received rains and the winter wheat crop greened up and lightweight calf prices last week jumped 10 bucks in Oklahoma with the anticipation of winter wheat there. So again, the market is going to find a way to put weight on cattle when we have high corn prices. It's just where is it going to be done? So probably the potential for backgrounding up here maybe uh, looked a little better, although they just brought calf prices up to where they are here just to, with that $10 increase. They were below us. But the more it rains in the southern plains, the more winter wheat's going to be there, the more they're going to bid up calves, and that's going to spread nationwide, and that's going to bring the lighter weight calf prices up higher relative to the heavier ones, and probably at least somewhat reduce the potential for backgrounding. The other issue we have on the right-hand side there is we have put up a lot of silage in the U.S., in particular in the western corn belt, and uh, the problem is we don't know how much silage that we put up. And uh, so uh, that's got to be fed to cattle. Some of it's going to go to cows to keep them going and, and so on, but a lot of it's going to be fed to calves. And so that's another thing that's going to keep a floor under calf prices and probably uh, cause them to uh, be, uh, be higher. So those are all issues that we're dealing with there. So let's just move along. Of course, Higher corn prices affected all feeder livestock, and I'm not going to get into the other species here, but you just kind of look at those top two charts there. Obviously, when corn goes up, it affects negatively the lightest weight calves the most because uh, feedlots are willing and, and want heavier weight cattle. So you see there, uh, five to 600 pound calves dropped more with that corn going up, and these are cash prices then relative to the futures. Or we'll go to the right-hand side, the seven to eight weights then, they did drop, but they didn't drop as much, again, encouraging backgrounding and encouraging higher weights. So that tells us, you know, that the market, again, is going to reward backgrounding. It's just who's got cheap enough feed to do it. And the thing that's underpinning and keeping feeder cattle prices at record high, and I guess that's one of the things maybe that I just wanted to mention back here, in spite of... LFTB, in spite of BSE, in spite of the worst drought in the Corn Belt since 1988, right now we still have record prices for feeder cattle for this time of the year. They've never been this high before. I know our expectations last spring were for higher prices now, but they did fall, but they are still at record levels compared to the other market or the, the other species which are way below that. So what's underpinning that is we're just very short of feeder cattle. Uh, on July 1st, we had 3% fewer feeder cattle than last year, and you go across on that chart, you see that we have the lowest number of feeder cattle that we've had for many, many years, which means excess feedlot capacity, and they're bidding for feeder cattle, so that's what's keeping them at record highs. So just jump ahead into the outlook here a little bit and then uh, move on to the other speakers that are really going to get into some of the economics. Uh, I use this sign here to, sh to, to show outlook, which uh, this is really a road sign, but you know, outlook can go all over the place. Prices can stay the same, they can go higher, they can go lower, they can take a bend in the road and uh, the, that sign says good luck and maybe that's part of what outlook is all about here. It's good luck and hope one of those irregular factors don't affect the market. So. Let's just jump jump to the 550 to six weight calves in North Dakota. These are at the prices from the four markets in North Dakota where we have USDA reporters, and that is on a periodic basis in West Fargo, and then from now through spring, uh, every sale at Napoleon and uh, Kiss and Mandan and Stockman. So these are kind of average I-94 prices. So those of you up in Botano listening, obviously you have to take a couple three dollars off of that, but I'm not as interested in the exact prices as just the trends. So in those lines on the bottom, again, from 2007 to 2010, just we're going to disregard them. I just left them in there to show you that that purple line in the middle there was last year where we set record high prices, and this year, Again, uh, particularly in the spring, we're, we were higher, and so we're going to set records this year, although we're getting very close to last year. And my idea is here, again, we're going to have a floor under these calf prices because the winter wheat is greened up, and we've got silage, and we've got a short supply. 
And so I think, you know, we're going to bring them more over. Instead of going up like they did last year significantly, we're going to kind of bring them over and maybe even see some weakness by November. So calf prices are likely going to be a little bit lower than last year to finish out the year, but still at, uh, at near uh, record levels there. What happened last year, why calf prices went up contra-seasonally when they're usually lowest in November, is corn fell $2 during that October time period last year. Fed cattle futures, the spring futures, went up 8 to $10. And again, we had some winter wheat uh, green up down south where they had a devastating drought like last year, so that is similar. But the chance of corn going down $2 in the next month or a couple months is uh, not impossible, <laughs> but it's very highly unlikely because our stocks are just much, much lower because uh, our crop is very low. So again, we can't expect cap prices to go up like they did, but again, a floor under them. And uh, you know, jump to the heavier weights then that would be coming out here in um, your, your background and calves that we're talking about tonight, steer calves. Again, the records being the same there. The other thing I have in this chart are the futures, which correspond to these 750 weight calves. So those light blue squares um, are the October and November futures, which according to the futures, at least in the way prices are now, it looks like the 750s will be a little bit above last year compared to the calves, it'll be a little bit below last year. But again, with $7 corn versus $4 or $5 corn, uh, that just makes the higher weights valuable. Usually, then when we go to the spring futures, which are those green squares, Usually in a normal year, the January and March futures prices are below the October and November futures prices because the seasonal low in these heavier weight backgrounded cattle is usually in February and March because that's what they're all coming to market. But last year, recall that wasn't the case. We had an inverted market and we had higher spring futures and the prices kept going up. So last year, backgrounding was very uh, a very good thing to do. And this year, they're not as high into March or January and March, but they still are higher than these fall futures. So the expectation of the market now is for us to increase uh, uh, prices, uh, some on these background cattle from what they are now. Again, with corn being the driving factor, and, and we need to put uh, a weight on calves for the, for the feedlot. Uh, so I'm just going to skip that, and um, here's the most recent market report from last week then of the actual prices at those three markets, and uh, again, s some of the other speakers here later on are going to use some of these prices and get into budgets and what different feeds we have and, and the costs and so on, but I just want to make a couple comments uh, about them, and actually I could talk about this particular slide I think for an hour but I just got to kind of finish up here. And if you look across to go down there and you see those 550 to 599, five to six weight calves, we had 500 of them, averaging 154. Uh, go down to the 750 to 800 pounds, which is, it shows you those 99, five, 756 to 788, averaging 144, about a $10 difference. Right now, the market, if, if you multiply those 200 pounds that you would put on there by those prices, the market's paying you about $1.17 right now. But if you look to the March futures, which today are trading at 153, that's only a dollar less than those 154 average calves. And so uh, in that particular case, then the market's paying a buck 50 right now for you to get those 550s into uh, into March. And so if you can do it for less than a buck fifty a pound, and even with seven dollar corn, I have a budget on my website that I think, you know, the feed costs are about 70 to 5 to 80 cents, and then you have your other costs along with that. Uh, you know, it certainly looks feasible. And I know John is going to talk about some different alternatives and so on in just a minute. The other thing is, look at, for those 550 to 6 weight calves, look at the wide range there, 147.25 up to 160. So that's the same weight and grade of calves sold at the same place. So there are cheaper ones being sold. So maybe there's some opportunity to buy some cheaper ones rather than the highest price ones. 
And I don't have the heifer went along here just in the interest of time, but last week, 400 pound heifers were $27 lower than their comparable steer weights. 550 pounders were $16 lower, 900 pounders $6 lower, and fed cattle the same. So on heifers, the more weight you put on them, the closer they get to steers all the way up to the same. So it looks like some opportunities on particularly the lightweight heifers as well. So again, just wrap things up here and let the other speakers talk. Feeder cattle are also affected by slaughter steer prices, and this would be a more longer term event, but we do expect uh, higher fed steer prices the rest of this year, and the futures are bearing that out with those blue, uh, darker blue dots there up to 125 and 127, and then again by the February futures up to 130, and these kind of do have to come through to get the feeder cattle futures the way they are, but this is moving in the right, right direction, which would be, again, positive for higher feeder 750 weights uh, come spring. So, uh, again, volatility is the name of the game. Uh, some of you have different preferences for price risk management. And um, I know, uh, I'm pretty sure that John is going to mention some of these alternatives as well, so I didn't uh, bring any along. And uh, so I'm just going to wrap up uh, there with, uh, I don't know, Carl, if we've got time to take questions or how we're going to go around or do that or wait till the end, but uh, that's kind of the end of my presentation for here. Thank you, Tim. I'll ask one quick question since it's still, um, if, if the price of corn hadn't gone up as much as it did, were we still on track to have a $20 increase in feeder calf prices? If you look back through feeder calf yeah. steer prices uh, for the past two years, it's gone up 20 bucks a hundred weight. Sure, yes. Uh, yeah, feeder cattle prices would have been at least 20 bucks higher across the board, but you still got the margin between calves, you see, and 750 weights to deal with. But yes, for sure, we corn corn going up, and, and of course it did, uh, did fall a little bit there in uh, September, but yes, we would have had, you know, if we would have had $4 corn, uh, we would have had much, much higher feeder cattle prices. Okay. Is there another question out there in the uh, interactive video network land uh, that we might have right now? If so, I'll answer one and then we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank I you, Tim. I will be around, Carl, in case you know there's a discussion later or something comes up. Or how about here in Fargo? Any questions? Thank you, Tim.